Dr. Pacho, are you muted? Hello, thank you. Um, okay, I don't know when the camera is, so I'm waving to everyone. Oh, it's there, that's stressful. Okay, hypoglycemia is a problem with insulin because what insulin does, we, we secrete insulin to uptake sugar from blood, right? So if we do that too well, then we can get low blood sugar, which is hypoglycemia. Glucagon does what? Glucagon encourages us to actually get more blood sugar available, right? It's going to encourage, oh, there's people, are they touring? Oh, maybe they're touring. Hello, people in the hall sharing. We're studying for boards. Um, but glucagon is going to encourage increased blood sugar, right? So we're going to encourage glucose release from our tissues. So it'd be the opposite problem. Great. Okay. Back to the game. Someone else call. Call it out. New category. Hormones 100. The epiphyseal plate is the target organ of this hormone. Oh dear. Holy moly. GH, ACTH, parathormone, glucagon. I feel like they may mean parathyroid hormones. GH, ACTH, parathormone, glucagon. Answer. Yes, GH. Good job. If you didn't know, if you're like, I don't know what the epiphyseal plate is, you could do some process of elimination, right? And that's what I, that's what I suggest on all of our NPLEX questions. When in doubt, if you're not 100% sure, eliminate the answers you know are wrong. All right, what's next? Good. This gland atrophies after puberty. Pituitary, thymus, pineal, thyroid. Great. Good. Awesome. Thymus. Thymus gland. There's not many adult, fully developed humans that have a thymus gland present that's active. Yes, your thymus gland atrophies. The rest do not. I guess unless if it's pathological, but in a normal state. All right, what's next? Ooh, big one, control for five, going for all the money. An excess of hormones in the blood may cause target organs to decrease the number of receptors for that hormone in a process called negative feedback, receptor inhibition, downregulation, positive feedback. An excess of hormones in the blood they cause target organs to decrease the number of receptors for that hormone in a process called, is it negative feedback, receptor inhibition, down regulation, or positive feedback? I see some A's, I see some B's, I see some C's, but I don't think I see any D's. And your answer is down regulation. This was a tricky one, but I got you them all. No, I got a lot of you. So yes, negative feedback when in doubt, it would be my answer. Okay, so when in doubt, if you're not sure, negative feedback is probably a solid decision because most of the time it's negative feedback. But why is this not negative feedback? Receptors. It's talking specifically about decreasing the number of receptors of the hormone, which is downregulation. If we're talking about decreasing the production of the hormone itself, that would be negative feedback or the secretion or release of the hormone itself. But because they added that tricky number of receptors on there, that is downregulation, right? That's a genetic piece. We're downregulating the production of those receptor proteins. Good. That one gets everyone every time. Fair. All right, what's next? Introduction for two. I like it. Hormones can be all of the following except proteins, eicosanoids, steroids, carbohydrates. What is a protein? What is a, what is a hormone not? Good, good, good some correct answers. Awesome. It is not a carbohydrate. Again, the eicosanoid I said is like maybe a hormone. Um, there, there's talk that it is on the street now. But yes, hormones can be prote proteins and steroids. They can't be carbs. Pro hormones are not carbohydrates. Great. What's next? Intro for three. Target organs respond to water-soluble hormones because of the presence of, uh, presence of blank on the cell membrane surface. Is that ATP, calcium, CAMP, specific receptors? On the cell membrane surface. What's on the membrane surface? That's your hint. 
Good. Awesome. Don't doubt yourself. Yes, you're right. So there's the receptors. All of these things can be involved, but receptors are on that cell membrane surface. Control for two. Much of the endocrine system regulates itself through a process called, now you've got it. Now you've got it. Oh yeah, easy peasy, negative feedback. You knew it was coming. Yes, all right. Hormones for three. This hormone is important in sodium regulation and therefore water balance. Aldosterone, ADH, cortisone, glucagon. Aldosterone, ADH, cortisone, glucagon. Aldosterone. Why isn't it ADH? Because sodium regulation, yes. What does ADH do? Water. Water mainly, sodium is the byproduct, right, of ADH. Aldosterone mainly sodium regulation. Okay, so aldosterone, sodium, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, think water, right? It's a diuretic. Water regulation. Sodium is a byproduct because we are either upping our water or lowering our water, and therefore that's going to change osmolarity based off of water concentration. Aldosterone affecting directly sodium retention or secretion. We will look at kidneys, I promise. All right. Woo woo. All right. Cushing's disease. Ooh, fun. It's caused by hyposecretion of adrenal glands, hyposecretion of the pancreas hypersecretion of the adrenal glands or hypersecretion of the pancreas? Is it hypo or hyper? And which gland is it affecting? Awesome. Y'all are fabulous. Hypersecretion of the adrenal glands. They will do stuff like this very straightforward, but they'll try to get you by just changing a few of the words, right? They'll make you think between hypo and hyper, between some glands that are maybe very close together. They love questions where they give you four options and they make it like the same two things that you have to choose between. They love this because it causes you to second guess yourself. We hate them. They love them. When I say they, I'm referring to question writers. Never been me. No. I didn't write questions like that on the exam. Okay. Uh, what's next? Pathology for two. Great. Endemic goiter results from a lack of what in the diet? Endemic Goiter, vitamin C, D, calcium, iodine. Yeah, easy, iodine, good. Big kahuna, exophthalmos is a sign of hypersecretion of what hormone? We know it's hyperthyroid, but what hormone? Probably the only one that makes sense. <laughs> thyroxine, good, awesome. What's thyroxine's abbreviation? T4, great. They could have also done thyroxine, TSH, triiodothionine, and thyrotropin, right? They could put all thyroid things there. That would be probably what would happen. Okay, what's next? We like pathology. I told you, at NUNM, you become very good pathologists. You learn pathology better than most of the schools. So we tend to do very well in pathology. We tend to do kind of not so great on physiology. Um, we tend to not do so great on uh, micro and immuno. So that's why we're spending some time on physio, micro, and immuno. Okay? We're spending a little time on path. Is that a hand or an answer? Okay, great. Perfect. <laughs> Acromegaly is a result of hypersecretion of this hormone. Thyroxine, cortisone, growth hormone, parathormone. I'm going to say parathyroid hormone, but I feel like they're trying to throw us for the loop. Yep, growth hormone. Good, good. Acromegaly. All right. We've gotten rid of pathology, so we have to choose something else. Hormone five. The target organ of thyrotropin releasing hormone is. What's the target organ? What is it targeting? Yes, good. Anterior pituitary gland. It's released from the hypothalamus and it's targeting the anterior pituitary gland. Perfect. That's how those type of questions will be asked. Secreting from or targeting will be their trigger words. 
Endocrine organs five, where is oxytocin produced? It's obvious on our screen, just don't ignore that. You already know. It's one of two produced from the posterior, oh. Oh, this is a tricky one. I tricked you all again. It's produced, I even said this to you all, I told you and then I even forgot. Oxytocin and ADH are secreted, or they're produced, sorry, not secreted, they're produced in the hypothalamus, then they're transferred and held in the posterior, posterior pituitary where they're secreted from. I stumped myself with my own question. <laughs> it's great. I was like, oh yeah, you got this. So yes, it's produced in the hypothalamus. It's secreted from the posterior pituitary. You'll never forget it now. I clearly will. Okay, which one's next? <laughs> Intro five, awesome. Hormones that directly activate genes are classified as amino acid-based, water-soluble, lipid-soluble, or G-proteins. Hormones that directly activate genes. So how could they do that? That'll be your helpful hint. Great. Most of you got it. If they're lipid-soluble, they are able to get through that cell membrane and directly activate genes. Perfect. Intracellular binding. Great, what's next? We're almost done. Good. Islet of Langerhorn is found in which endocrine organ? Thyroid, parathyroid, pancreas, adrenal. Pancreas, correct. Good, got that anatomy down. Fantastic, sorry, I'm getting loud. In which region of the adrenal gland is aldosterone produced? We had a picture of this the other day after our practice test. See how good our memory is. Is it the zona reticularis, the adrenal cortex, the zona fasciculata, or the adrenal medulla? Where, what region of the adrenal gland is aldosterone produced? And then after this, always refer back to that, that picture and def definitely know those zones. They love these questions. They love it. Adrenal cortex. Bees, nice job. Again, I'll pull up that picture. I'll put that picture back on the board for you in the future. But that's one of those things that you just need to commit to memory. So if you're going to, I don't say memorize a lot. I say be able to logically reason your way through things. But if you're going to commit something to memory, those zones will be an important thing and what they produce. The glomerulosa in a yeah, they don't have the glomerulosa on here as an answer, so that would probably be your your best answer. But of these answers allowed, adrenal cortex would be your best. But yes, glomerulosa is your next your other layer. Absolutely, correct. Hence the picture. Memorize those four zones. But when given, we saw, you know, on Tuesday, they had Faber's test, which we would never be tested on in NPLEX 1. So they often will include questions that aren't fabulous, but answers that aren't perfect, right? The best answer. All right, which one's next? We have nine. <laughs> Control three, okay. Hormones are secreted in response to all of the following stimuli, except what stimuli are they not secreted from? Neuronal, humoral, hormonal upregulation. You answered upregulation, you're correct. Remember that slide I had, there's neuronal, there's humoral, there's hormonal, all three of those. Hormones can be secreted in response to upregulation is not going to directly secrete hormone response. It's just going to increase receptors, right? Okay, eight more. Control for four. The anterior pituitary stimulates other endocrine organs by secreting a group of hormones called releasing factors, tropic hormones, relay proteins, target hormones. Trust your gut. I 
I saw some last minute answer changers. Don't do it. Tropic hormones. You know who I'm talking to. Don't change it if you know it. Tropic hormones. Those are hormones that target other endocrine organs. Tropic hormones. Hormone four. For which hormone is the role in males not well understood? Great. Good. Awesome. Answer. Prolactin, right? FSH and LH in males can affect the um, testes, which can affect androgen synthesis. Prolactin, while there are some recent studies out about potentially effects on males, um, is not something that will be included in your NPLEX in its recent research, right? I told you, anything within the last two years is probably not going to be included on NPLEX. So I, I doubt we'd see a COVID question. Okay. Four, endocrine for four. Which endocrine gland is tiny, yellow, brown in color, and arranged in thick branching cords? Is that the pituitary, the parathyroid, the thyroid, or the pineal? Gross anatomy. Tiny, yellow, brown in color, and arranged in thick branching cords. There's your pituitary, your parathyroid, your thyroid, your pineal gland. Right? If you have no clue, justify your answer by getting rid of things that you think are wrong and then choosing your best guess, right? Your parathyroid gland. Okay, so B, so those of you that chose the guess of parathyroid, fantastic. There won't be many gross anatomy questions on there, but there definitely will be a few. Most of the time, if they do a gross anatomy question or a microscopic anatomy question, it'll be something like, what muscle tissues are striated versus smooth? What muscles have, you know, um, what's the size of the nuclei of certain cells versus non? They're likely to not do this type of a um, gross anatomy question, but they have in the past. Yes. They are. They're tiny. They're yellow, brown in color. They're these little thick, tiny branching cords, but they're a little tiny dot. So think about, think about branching. So they're literally coming off of the thyroid gland tissue. So that's the branching cords. They are branching off of that thyroid gland tissue. It's not like a gross visible cord. Like don't think of like a cord of like the... Uh, um, what am I thinking of? Ureters, like not like a thick type of cord connecting one thing to another in the thyroid tissue. Yep. If you look at what is the gross structure of the parathyroid gland, this is how they will describe it in your gross anatomy textbook. But can you see that grossly? No, it would be microscopically cord attaching. Is this a terrible question? 100%. Is it been on the NTUX before? Yes. <laughs> okay. It's awful. <laughs> I cannot confirm or deny. Um, okay, endocrine. All right, hormones too. Woo. What are the effects of PGH? Does it increase osteoclast activity? Does it increase calcium reabsorption in the kidney? Does it increase calcium absorption in the intestine? Does it do all of the above? Remember, when they say, if there's more than one right, choose all the above, right? So when in doubt, if you find more than one that you cannot rule out on these type of questions, it's probably all of the above. Typically, in those all of the above, there's two that seem really good. There's one that you're like, I'm not sure. But if two you know are correct, then it is going to be all of the above, right? Okay, 100, controller, oh, introduction, okay. Endocrine glands differ from exocrine in that they do not have a blood supply, have ducts, secrete chemical messengers, have cells. Please don't choose that. <laughs> Thank you, all right. Have ducts, yes, exocrine glands have ducts, right? They release stuff, not ducts, quack, quack, and endocrine glands do not. They all have cells, so thank you for getting that right. Okay, control endocrine organs or introduction. Intro, we're feeling good about the intro. Okay, most of the amino acid-based hormones affect the target organs using 
intracellular chemical messengers, or second messengers, intracellular receptors, direct activation of genes, or relay proteins. Most amino acid-based hormones affect target organs using. Good, 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 awesome. Intracellular second messengers. Remember, amino acid-based hormones are big. They have to bind externally, and then they activate stuff internally through a second messengering system. They're not able to directly enter the cell. So intracellular receptors are going to be smaller hormones or lipid-based hormones that can directly get through the cell. They can then directly activate genes because they're intracellular or in, uh, inside the nucleus, like thyroid hormone. Relay proteins, I don't know what that means. So secondary cellular messenger. All right, endocrine or control? Control. It's very, like, you're solid. Which area of the brain regulates the endocrine system? The cerebral cortex, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, or the neurohypophysis? Neurohypophysis. Hypophysis. Can't talk. Endocrine system. Which area of the brain? Yep. Awesome. Hypothalamus. Good, good, good. And last one. Well, we have final jeopardy, but in which region of the adrenal gland is aldosterone produced? Now it's the now it's oh it's again oh it's again wrong okay so <laughs> it's it's twice not so nice all right hold on I have our final round and we're moving into biochemistry land okay not ten hours. Sorry, not what I'm going for. <laughs> All right, that was your uh, comedic relief. Okay, final round. A person with endemic goiter suffers from what? For you. All right, everyone has the answer. The song's done. All right, great. Hypofunctioning thyroid gland. Okay, hypofunctioning endemic goiter. What's an endemic goiter from? Iodine deficiency. So if we don't have iodine, we can't make what? T3, T4, right? If we can't make T3, T4, is our thyroid gland going to be functioning at a higher low rate? Low rate. We don't have the actual, pro the actual hormones that do the thing. Now, will that potentially cause us to have upstream effects at TSH and TRH? Absolutely, right? We're going to definitely see those upstream effects, but it's a hypofunctioning thyroid gland with an endemic goiter. Yes, with hyperthyroidism, you can still see a goiter. Typically, it's a painless goiter, um, and I, you see that most commonly in more grave hyperthyroidism. The keyword here is endemic. Yes, endemic goiter. And in suffering, endemic goiter specifically is your iodine deficient goiter. Yes. You can see a goiter in Hashimoto's as well. Yes. Goiter is not a great uh, clinical characteristic to differentiate between hypo and hyperthyroid. It's a good OSCE question. Sometimes later on, they'll throw a goiter in your exam to try to confuse you. Okay, great. All right, you have now successfully learn the endocrine system. Now my favorite area is biochemistry. That's for real. I was a biochem major, so I love biochem. Okay. What would be helpful for you all as you follow along with biochemistry? My goal here is for us to, by the way, for us to power through biochem with the intention today then that you can work on that sheet that I posted on the Moodle page if you haven't already, that PDF, and then we'll start fresh. So if we get through it through the end, before the end of time today, great, we'll get out a little early. If it takes us through the end of the class and beyond, fabulous, that's great too. But I think we can do it. We have got more than, a little bit more than an hour, so I think we'll be able to get through biochemistry today. My big piece with this, as we go through, on the Moodle page, like I said, I posted that PDF. Dr. Taylor created it originally. 
Um, we've updated it a little bit. But your main things you're looking for is the different processes that we're going to go through, your substrates and your products, your key regulatory enzymes or key regulatory intermediates, um, your energy outputs or inputs needed to make these processes go through, and steps of control, positive or negative control on these systems. Okay? Those are going to be your big bangs for your box on biochemistry. And again, each section of the NPLEX study guide has a question saying, know the biochemical processes of this organ system. Now, as we know, biochemical processes aren't necessarily just located or focused in one organ system. They typically have applications amongst multiple different tissues, as we'll see. So that's why you'll see tissues included here in this PowerPoint. You'll see every, um, if there's a tissue where this certain process is really active in, you'll see that tissue there, okay? Um, but really, a lot of these questions don't fit good in just one organ system. So you'll see it included in a cardio question, included in a GI question, included in an integumentary question. There'll be this random biochemistry question. Like, how did they connect this? And this will often be something where you're not reading your vignette, right? You're just answering it based off of what you know. Okay. So our first process that we'll, we'll talk about is glycolysis. Glycolysis, it's seen here in its entirety. You do not have to draw out glycolysis for your NPLEX exam. If you can draw out glycolysis, you are way ahead of mostly everyone on this NPLEX exam. When you're taking biochemistry, yes, you have to draw this out. But really the things you need to know about glycolysis is that this is gonna be occurring in a state that it typically is oxygen rich. It occurs in all tissues. And it's our process where we take glucose that comes into the body and it converts it into pyruvate. Now, glycolysis can use other sugars. You can use fructose. You can use any monosaccharide, but it's going to come into the process of glycolysis at a different spot. That's the key piece there. But you can still go through the process of glycolysis with any monosaccharide or disaccharide that gets broken down into a monosaccharide. In fact, all of your monosaccharides, even though they come in at different places, will use the same amount of energy expenditure to go from their monosaccharide state to pyruvate, which is awesome. It means that we can focus just on glucose when it comes to committing things to memory. Even if they talk about fructose or um, maltose or any of your disaccharides or monosaccharides, you can just think about the process for glucose, for glycolysis. Now, if you had to take this for biochemistry, that'd be a different story, right? You would need to know those different shunting pathways. So in glycolysis, it occurs in all tissues. The key piece here is it's in the cytosol of the cell. This is one that's not occurring in the mitochondria that makes it different. You're starting with glucose, you're ending with pyruvate. Your key enzyme step here, and I'll get my little pointer. Your key enzyme step here is phosphofructokinase. Where'd my pointer go now? Oh dear. Okay, phosphofructokinase, PFK1, which is occurring right here in step three. So this is your key regulatory step of glycolysis. It's the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate using the enzyme phosphofructokinase. It does use ATP or energy input. That's part of why it's important. Your other two enzymes, if you had the bandwidth to remember, would be hexokinase and glucokinase. Hexokinase is on here. Glucokinase is not. That's one of the shunt through pathways for fructose or galactose, is using glucokinase instead of using hexokinase. Same exact enzyme mechanism. They do the same exact thing. They take whatever monosaccharide it is and they slap a phosphate on the number six carbon. Okay? The key cofactor for hexokinase and glucokinase, and that's why this is on the slide, is magnesium. So this is one of the enzymes that uses magnesium as a cofactor. They love their cofactors, so anytime a cofactor might be important, I'll try to mention it here. That's a common question. So we go through this whole process. We split here into two, yada, yada, yada. We end up with pyruvate. That's our end product in glycolysis. It's upregulated, meaning it's going to increase this process when we have insulin around, when we have fructose 2, 6, bisphosphate around, and when we have AMP. All those three are going to increase 
They're going to upregulate the process of glycolysis. AMP makes sense because we know then we need more ATP. Glycolysis gets the process started to produce ATP, our energy molecule. Insulin makes sense because we're trying to pull glucose and use it instead of leave it in the cell. And fructose 2 6 bisphosphonate, that's a, a factor that we're going to see come into play when we're talking about gluconeogenesis and we're dealing with glycogen synthesis and those type of pieces of the puzzle. But essentially, all of the processes that upregulate it are we're trying to get glucose out of the blood and into usable energy. Okay? That's our big purpose, our big goal here. A key intermediate then is glucose 6 phosphate. Why is glucose 6 phosphate a key intermediate in glycolysis? Because once glucose gets converted into glucose 6 phosphate, it can't leave the cell. So glucose is shunted into the cell via glute transporter. Once inside, once converted to glucose 6-phosphate, it's committed to the step of glycolysis. Anything that commits us to that step is going to be a key intermediate. Overall energy production for glycolysis gives us two pyruvates, two ATPs, and two NADHs. ATP, that's easy, that's energy currency that we can think about. NADH is going to become energy in the electron transport chain. For every one NADH, I believe it's, gosh, is it three and a half or two and a half? Two and a half ATPs per one NADH. Do you need to know that number? No. So don't commit it to memory. NADH gives you more energy than FADH2. So NADH is a little bit more energy producing. So you get two NADH, which will become ATP, and you get two pyruvate, which will become a lot of ATP because you're going to put pyruvate in our next step, which we'll get to here. It gets to move on down the pathway. So on your sheet, glycolysis, all tissues, cytosol, glucose, pyruvate, magnesium is a key cofactor. Phosphofructokinase is your important enzyme, as well as hexokinase and glucokinase. Insulin, fructose 2,6-bisphosphonate, and AMP, you're going to upregulate it. 2-pyruvate, 2-NADH, 2-ATP. See, biochemistry is not that scary when you get to simplify it down this much. I teach uh, biochemistry majors biochemistry, so um, that was why I taught this last spring. So this has been fun to not have to do every single enzymatic reaction. I love this. But for us, we need a functional use. We need to know why it's going to be important in our body. We don't need to know every single in and out. So then pyruvate oxidation. So we have gotten pyruvate now. So we got pyruvate from glycolysis. Now we're going to take pyruvate and convert it into a usable thing that we can then put into our next step, which will be our Krebs cycle, our TCA, or citric acid cycle. So pyruvate oxidation occurs specifically in tissues that have mitochondria and oxygen in high amounts. So if we're in a deoxygenated state, this would not occur. Okay. It happens within the mitochondrial matrix. So we have now transported pyruvate from the cytosol inside the mitochondria, into the mitochondrial matrix. Our substrate's pyruvate, and our product is acetyl-CoA. Remove the E at the end of that little I'm trying to find no E here. Acetyl-CoA is our product. We can see here pyruvate gets transported into the mitochondria. Pyruvate dehydrogenase. PDH, that's the key regulatory enzyme here. And why it's so important is because it needs five separate cofactors. It needs NAD, FAD, TPP, COA, and lipoic acid. Oh my. What essentially that means is it's going to need multiple different B vitamins. It's going to need thiamine in TPP. It's going to need niacin in NAD. And it's going to need riboflavin in FAD. So anytime you see something that needs NAD or NADH, you are using niacin. It needs that as a part of its, it's part of the structure of NAD, NADH. FAD or FADH2, riboflavin is a part of the structure. And TPP, thiamine, thiamine pyrophosphate, has thiamine in the name, B1. So a key piece for biochemistry that they can do is they can ask you about B vitamin deficiencies and then ask you about what enzyme might be affected 
if you have a thiamine deficiency. So if someone's an alcoholic and they have depleted their thiamine score, what cofactor or enzymatic step in pyruvate oxidation could be affected? You're looking for what can be affected by TPP, pyruvate dehydrogenase is one of those key regulatory enzymes. That's how you'll see some of these questions worked into the end plot. So being able to identify and tag where these certain vitamins are. So if they give you a vitamin deficiency type question, you can then be like, okay, biochemically, I know anytime I see NAD or NADH, niacin is being used in that molecule. So if they're saying I have an issue with something with niacin or they're taking niacin, I know it's going to affect every time I see an NAD, NADH. Your product then is acetyl-CoA, which is going to get put it into most of the time in an oxygenated state, the Krebs cycle or TCA cycle. But we'll talk about sometimes when that doesn't occur. Your key regulatory factors here are going to be if you have NAD, it's going to push it forward. Why? Because you get to produce an NADH here, which is an energy molecule. So you're getting an energy gain in the long term. So if you have a lot of NAD, it's going to push this pathway forward. If you have a lot of ADP, it's also going to push this pathway forward because, again, the end product of getting to acetyl-CoA is going to ideally go into Krebs cycle, which is energy producing. So we'll get ATP at the end. Your energy production that you're getting, sometimes these will be minus, but we're still plus right now. You get two acetyl-CoAs and two NADHs per pyruvate molecule. And part of that is you can think about, carb, um, you can do some carbon tracking here. So we have one, two, three carbons present in a pyruvate. We have two pyruvate molecules per um, glucose. So at the end of glycolysis, we get two pyruvate. So at the end of this, we're going to get two acetyl coa okay. One carbon leaves in the form of CO2. So that's where our carbon tracking goes. This goes away. These two carbons attach on to COA and become a CO-CoA, coenzyme A. So far so good? Per for one glucose. So one glucose becomes two pyruvate, two pyruvate becomes two acetyl-CoA. So if you're just tracking one pyruvate, you would go one pyruvate per one acetyl-CoA. But since we're always trying to think of what would our actual energy expenditure be at top, typically it's going to be a monosaccharide of some kind. So if we're starting with glucose, we have two pyruvate. Two pyruvate oxidation gives us two acetyl-CoA. That's often how they'll do tracking too. So if you're reading through certain textbooks, they'll do like ATP tracking in looking through the guise of glucose. What would glucose give us? Not looking through what does one acetyl-CoA give you? Most common, my grad biochem students, that's the most common thing that they get mixed up in is, is are we tracking a glucose molecule? Are we tracking acetyl-CoA molecule? When in doubt for us, I want you always to think about what would be biochemically useful. So we'd be starting with glucose because we're trying to actually take glucose and get it to energy. If you're going to learn one enzyme, I think pyruvate dehydrogenase is probably my top enzyme because it has all five of those cofactors. And so if you can remember those five cofactors, it can help you in a myriad of ways downstream. This would be your intermediate step between glycolysis and either the Krebs cycle or lactic acid. OK. So now an aside. Before we get to cellular respiration using uh, oxygen, our aerobic cellular respiration, I want to do a little aside on anaerobic glycolysis. Really, this is um, anaerobic glycolysis is the process of then going from glycolysis is the same. We still get pyruvate, but then instead of taking pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we're taking pyruvate to lactate. So we think of our lactic acid buildup, working out, high exercise state, lack of oxygen perfusion to our tissues. We're going to do some anaerobic glycolysis or anaerobic respiration. Okay. Again, occurring in any tissue that doesn't have oxygen. So if you had myocardial infarction and you have an area of the heart that's ischemic, that's not getting adequate oxygen supply or perfusion, and we're still, we are still trying to produce some energy, it will undergo anaerobic glycolysis. 
if that lack of perfusion or that infarction stays for a long enough time, lactic acid will build up because it has nowhere to go. And then you can get necrosis and death of the tissue because that's a toxic buildup of a byproduct, right? So that's how you could see some of these questions getting put into a cardiovascular case. So occurs in tissues without oxygen. Happens within the cytosol. So this is a process where pyruvate, instead of being shunted into the mitochondria for pyruvate oxidation, it would stay in your cytosol. It starts with pyruvate at the end of glycolysis. Your key enzyme step is lactate dehydrogenase, LDH. Going to use similar cofactors as our previous pyruvate dehydrogenase. You're still going to need TPP, FAD, and NAD. I don't believe you need a lipoic acid or CoA. But you still are going to need your three B vitamins for this process. Lactate dehydrogenase. Your product is lactate. It's regulated by NADH. Because instead of gaining a NADH, you lose an NADH in this process. So it is an energy-using process. So for anaerobic respiration, you end up making two ATP versus aerobic respiration. You can make anywhere from like 30 to 36, 38 in some textbooks. So obviously anaerobic respiration, not so fuel efficient, but it can give us some energy if we're in a state for a short amount of time where we need some ATP around. But we are overall, we're decreasing, we're minusing an NADH every time we do this conversion. So we're exchanging that to try to get some energy out of it. Yes. TPP, NAD, and FAD. So NADH specifically goes from NADH to NAD. That'd be, yes, yeah, so niacin, B2, or B3 is, B3 is niacin. B2 is riboflavin, B1 is thiamine. TPP, thiamine tyrophosphate, B1. FAD or FADH2, riboflavin, B2. NAD, NADH, niacin, B3. If you say it in your head, it'll stick. And then you'll confuse it sometimes like me because of my memory. Try. Keep me honest. Okay. That's all you really need to know with this. Really the big key step here, not occur occurring without oxygen, ends up with lactate. Over time, that's going to be a toxic byproduct for the body if you can't eliminate and get rid of it. Um, you're having a small amount of energy benefit for a larger amount of energy loss right? The only ATP you're getting is from glycolysis. That ATP that it's showing here for anaerobic respiration is the two ATP from glycolysis, but you have a net loss of one NADH from anaerobic respiration itself. So you get one NADH total. So there was, you had two NADHs from glycolysis, you minus one, and then you get two ATP from glycolysis. That's it. It's a very short-term energy strategy. Great for exercise, bad if we have tissue, lack of tissue perfusion. Now the Krebs cycle, whoo, the big kahuna. This is probably like the thing we talk about the most. This occurs in all tissues as long as oxygen is present. This happens within the mitochondrial matrix. We've continued to get deeper and deeper within the cell. Yes. So you, I mean, you need NAD to be present, right? So you need NADH to become NAD. So you would need niacin there. You're also, if NADH wasn't present, then you couldn't actually make that reaction move forward. It wouldn't be consuming. You're not consuming. So anytime you have the NAD, NADH, or FADH2 to FADH, you're not actually consuming or utilizing those molecules. You're doing um, an oxidation reduction reaction, right? We're removing a hydrogen or we're giving a hydrogen, we're removing an electron or giving an electron. But if you have a deficiency in one of those B vitamins, you won't actually have adequate stores of NADH or FADH2. And then you couldn't move those reactions forward. So that's more of what I'm talking about. You're not actually building them up at all, ever, in these biochemical processes. Yeah. Good question, though. Absolutely. So if you have a deficiency, though, and you have a lack of ability to synthesize NAD, NADH, 
or FADH2, FADH, then you're not going to be able to move these reactions forward if you don't actually have those molecules present in the first place or if they're present in an inadequate amount. Different than magnesium or uh, molybdenum or selenium used as a cofactor for an enzyme specifically where it's being consumed by the enzyme or bound to the enzyme to move forward. And then it's recycled. It's not completely destroyed. It's just bound to, moves the enzyme forward, and then unbinds. Okay. For the Krebs cycle, though, we are now deep into the mitochondria. So we have from cytosol to mitochondria to mitochondrial matrix. We are the most deep that we are within the mitochondria in the Krebs cycle, TCA cycle, citric acid cycle. You could see any of those three names on your NPLEX exam. They all refer to this cycle, Krebs, TCA, or citric acid. Your main substrate you're starting with is your acetyl-CoA after our pyruvate conversion. Your key enzyme steps, there's several, but one of the key enzyme steps is your isocitrate dehydrogenase right here and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase right here. These would be your two kind of big kahuna enzyme steps. They require the same five cofactors that we learned before. So those same five come back again to haunt us. So these two steps, key regulatory step, we go from isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate as an intermediate, and then we move to succinyl CoA. So that CoA comes back, which is why we have to have CoA, coenzyme A, as a cofactor. Your end product of the Krebs is carbon dioxide, NADH, GTP in the form of energy, or ATP, depends on who's drawing it, and FADH2. Those are your end products. Because when you put acetyl-CoA in, what's going out is CO2 as a byproduct. But otherwise, the cycle, all those key intermediary steps and enzymes are just staying there. You're not consuming or using. They're just staying there in that cycle. And then you're putting acetyl-CoA in, and you're churning it around, pushing out carbon dioxide. Again, cellular respiration, that makes sense. We have oxygen going in. We push out carbon dioxide going out. That fits what we know about the respiratory system. And then in exchange, we get energy. Regulation factors NAD, FAD, and GDP are going to encourage Krebs cycle turns around the Krebs cycle because we want to make their energetic form. We want NADH, we want FADH2, and we want GTP. And lots of ATP and lots of citrates are going to decrease our ability for the Krebs cycle to turn. ATP, because when we're in a high energy state, we don't need to create more energy. And citrates, if we have lots of citrate present, this actually will block this step from going forward. Citrate can be used in a couple different other pathways. I don't see this common, but it is something that you should recognize. Where this could come into uh, play for y'all on uh, NPLEX, I don't feel, I. I've never seen them use the citrate piece on the NPLEX exam. I have seen them use NAD, FAD, GTP, and ATP, GDP and ATP as a regulatory factor. Key intermediates, many. If you could commit one cycle to memory, this would be the cycle. I would try to commit the intermediates to memory if you could. If you can't, at least know that main key um, enzymatic step. Know that you start with acetyl-CoA, it's gonna churn around you're going to get CO2, and then no, you're going to go from isocitrate to succinyl-CoA. So this process right here. But if you are able to commit this circle, this cycle to memory, it could come up. They have asked questions about any component of the cycle before. Yeah. You have a mnemonic? Do you want to share it? She has a mnemonic for you all. <laughs> awesome. So definitely not the most appropriate one I've heard, but pretty good. Definitely will help you remember it. Absolutely. Sounds like a Dr. Chamberlain mnemonic. Um, if any, do any of you know him, then you know. Yes. Great.
I love that. How does that citrate? Yeah. So great. Yep. This is succinyl CoA to succinate and then fumarate malate oxoelastate. I love it. That's great. I think that both of those are fabulous. I think however you can commit this to memory would be helpful. Um, this intermediate, you don't need to know. So cis, uh, that, that is not an intermediate that's commonly used. So it'd be citrate, isocitrate, ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA, succinate, fumarate, malate, oxaloacetate. So those, I believe, eight intermediate. Your energy production from this, you're going to get three NADHs and one FADH2. And you actually are getting uh, a GTP, I believe, somewhere. Yep, you get a GTP right here. You also get one GTP. And this is per turn, right? So one time around gets you those things. So we have two acetyl-CoA. That we started with because we had glucose gave us two pyruvates two acetyl coas so we get two turns per glucose molecule so you're going to end up with six nadh two fadh2 and two gtp by the end of that and you can add what you got from the beginning that's how you end up getting if you go through glycolysis pyruvate oxidation and krebs you end up getting between 30 to 32 atp at the end they used to say 34 to 36, but now the correct answer is closer to 30 to 32. Okay. On NPLEX, they'll probably give you a range of anywhere from 30 to 38. That'd be fine. Most of the time when they do an ATP question, it is about like, if you have a glucose molecule, how much energy could it generate through the electron transport chain? So through all that end phase. And they'll give you something in that range of 30 to 38. And then they'll give you something in the low teens and something way high. And then something that just seems completely wrong, like zero energy or an answer, or none of the above. If you're in that 30 to 38 range, so you're safe to choose that as an answer. But the true, true answer would be 30 to 32. The, the range depends on um, actually the tissue. There's a, there is a difference between what tissue it occurs in. There's a specific shunt, citric acid shunt. That's your Krebs. Those are your main three. If you only want to, if you hate biochemistry and you only want to study a few things, those four would be my top for you. But there's many other pathways that you need to know. Sorry for those online that I feel that. So glycogen synthesis is the next. So glycogen synthesis occurs specifically in the liver. So now we get some tissue specific locations for biochemistry. It's going to happen within the cytosol. So like glycolysis, another one that's occurring in cytosol, and you're starting with glucose. Instead of shunting glucose, though, to make energy, you're shunting it to storage in the form of glycogen, glycogen synthesis. Your key enzyme step is going to be phosphoglucomutase. There's also a secondary key enzyme step that is glycogen synthase. But if you're going to remember one, phosphoglucomutase would be the one I'd start with that commits glucose to this pathway. And then glycogen synthase takes four glucose molecules and kind of combines them together in the branching process that we see in glycogen. It's regulated by UTP. UTP is a structure, this is UDP. UTP is the triphosphate form of UDP, similar to ATP, GTP. It's going to bind to your glucose molecule and act almost like a, uh, as a cofactor for a sugar, that's the best way I could describe it to you. It's going to bind to glucose. It's going to help move it through a reaction that then binds it to this chain. It allows it to have these alpha binds of glucose along instead of always binding. It's going to allow this alpha 1 4 glycosidic bond to occur, which happens at the end of your glycogen branch. It allows us to create this really stacked, tight formation of glucose. That's what glycogen does. Energy production, it's going to use up one ATP and it's going to use up a glucose. So it's not going to be energy producing, it's energy storing. But I think the key points here, it occurs in the liver tissue specifically. 
you can have, you obviously do have some glycogen in muscle, skeletal muscle tissue, but primarily it's occurring in your liver tissue, this process, and in the cytosol. And you're using UTP as your, UDP glucose is your key intermediate, and it's regulated by UTP. Uses energy, does not gain energy. All right. Yes. Yeah, uh, insulin and glucagon. Yep. So you're going to, if you need more glucose, glucagon is going to um, regulate the breakdown of it. So it's going to pull, pull it. If you need less glucose, um, if you have insulin in the plenty, glucose is probably going to be taken up by cells first. So it's not going to have a direct effect, but it could affect it downstream insulin. Glucagon, though, is what stimulates us to say we need to take glycogen and then break it down, which we're going to get to. So I have this here, the next two slides, I have glycogenolysis and this is supposed to be gluconeogenesis. This is what I wanted to avoid doing was to confuse you. So I'm going to actually stop, get out of this right now, discard. So glycogenolysis. Let me grab my color. Okay. So we are going to focus on this side here. We are going to ignore this right here. Okay. So glycogenolysis. We're occurring in liver and muscle tissue because we're we're focusing on getting glycogen and using it to actually create some energy. So where is glycogen? It's mainly in the liver and it's a little bit in skeletal muscle. So our substrate is going to be glycogen. This also occurs in the cytosol. So again, we are in the cytosol for this as well. So far, pyruvate oxidation and the Krebs cycle are the only two things that have happened in the mitochondria. Our key enzyme step here it's going to be glycogen phosphorylate. And you can see that here. Where is my pointer? Right here. It's going to require biotin as its cofactor. So that's a new one. So biotin is a cofactor. And then also glucose 6-phosphate. It's going to be our other important enzyme. Or glucose 6-phosphatase, I should say. Glucose 6-phosphate or glucose are going to be our main product. Glucose itself is the product for primarily the liver kidney. Glucose 6-phosphate is primarily the product for skeletal muscle. Regulated by low energy states, it's going to cause us to do this. So if we need sugar, so AMP, cyclic AMP, it's downregulated by glucose. If we have a hyperglycemic state, if you're a diabetic um, or any, any issues with having elevated blood sugar, it's going to downregulate glycogenolysis. And again, key intermediate, glucose 6-phosphate. Mainly because this step decides what we're going to do. Are we going to shunt through a different pathway or are we going to go directly back towards glucose? Because you can do glucose 6-phosphate and you can go down glycolysis then. Or you can take it straight up to glucose and use it right then for energy. Put glucose back into the blood, which then will go through glycolysis. Glycogenolysis. Now, gluconeogenesis. So we're going to cross off this part here. This isn't even, I'm going to actually get off this picture. I'm going to get off the picture completely. I'm going to completely disregard both these images. Because gluconeogenesis deals nothing with glycogen. Glycogenolysis, glycogen. Gluconeogenesis, no glycogen. Gluconeogenesis, our goal is to get to glucose 
but we're starting with different products. This is a place where we could use lactate to reconvert back to energy. So what happens, big question I get, what happens with um, once we get a bunch of lactate, once we've done anaerobic respiration, how does it actually get reused in the body? You can go through gluconeo gluconeogenesis and actually recreate glucose from it. Other things that can become glucose, the other substrates that happen in this process, alanine, lactate, and glycerol are your main three substrates. Glycerol being pulled from triglycerides, from fats, alanine from protein breakdown or amino acid breakdown and lactic acid or lactate from our anaerobic respiration. This occurs specifically in the liver and the kidney, somewhat in the small intestine, but I'd say for the most part, liver kidney would be your major areas. This is another part that's occurring within the mitochondrial matrix or some part of it, or sometimes all of it in the cytosol or in the endoplasmic reticulum. So it can occur in all three of those organ spaces within the cell. Part of it depends on what the substrate is going to be. Your key step here is gonna be pyruvate carboxylase. Phosphofructokinase is probably my second most important key enzyme step. I think they're all kind of listed here. <laughs> Glucose 6-phosphatase is also listed. These are your main enzyme steps that are opposite of glycolysis. So this product, this process at its baseline is going to be glycolysis in reverse with three different steps that shunt around. And I will post a picture on this. I'll update the PowerPoint. It actually has a picture that shows glycolysis going down and gluconeogenesis going up. You can see the three shunting pathways. Those would be the key three enzymes you want to remember. Your end product this time is glucose. It's regulated by acetyl-CoA. There's lots of acetyl-CoA. Then you could start this process because your body's like, I don't need more acetyl-CoA. I want more glucose. It's downregulated by fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Key intermediates, pyruvate fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate being that committal step, right, with glucose at the beginning. So to get to glucose, we actually have to go from glucose 6-phosphate back to glucose, which is why that enzyme is not hexokinase. It's glucose 6-phosphatase. And energy production is energy wasting, right? We're producing glucose. We're not going to gain energy. We're going to lose energy. So we minus two pyruvate potentially, if you're starting from, if you're thinking about just glycolysis in reverse, you're going to lose two pyruvate. Or if you're starting with alanine or lactate or glycerol, you may not be actually losing a pyruvate. But you're going to use two NADHs, four ATP, and two GTP in this process. So it's a very much an energy wasting process, but if you need sugar in your blood for use quickly, this is probably going to be your fastest way of getting there once your glycogen stores have stopped. Gluconeogenesis, reverse of glycolysis, three workaround steps, energy wasting. Liver, kidney, main places it occurs, a little bit in the small intestine, can take byproducts of proteins, carbs, and fat, and actually make them into energy. How are we doing so far? You glossed over yet or are you still okay? I know it's stuff to me a lot. Okay. The pentose phosphate pathway. So now we start getting into, into these specialized pathways. For so far, we've been dealing with carbohydrate metabolism. Now we're gonna start to move into still some carbohydrate metabolism, but we're gonna start working it down our road into our other important biochemical molecules. We're going to get into fats, we're going to get into some proteins, we're going to get into urea byproducts. So what you have here in this process is you have glycolysis on the left side here. So going from glucose all the way down to pyruvate here, you actually then have um, alcoholic respiration, so going down to ethanol. But pyruvate here is our normal glycolysis end. 
And then we have this pentose phosphate pathway over here shown on this side, an oxidative and non-oxidative section. So oxidative and non-oxidative. Pentose phosphate pathway occurs in our liver, our red blood cells within the mammary glands, and the adrenal cortex. These are the main areas that the pentose phosphate pathway occurs. It happens also within the cytosol, which is helpful. Our substrate we start with is glucose 6-phosphate. So when I said that was the committal step of glycolysis, there we go, of glycolysis, glucose 6-phosphate, that's the starting for our pentose phosphate pathway. Our product is going to be NADPH and ribose sugars. Why is it important that we can create NADPH? Yeah, glutathione. It's used as a cofactor for a lot of these reactions, right? NADPH or NADH. So this is a process, pentose phosphate, phosphate pathway, shows us how we can generate some of these molecules that are key for our other biochemical processes. So that's why it's a helpful shunt. So when you have some glucose 6-phosphate made, if it's not all needed to go down to pyruvate for energy in that moment, you can shunt some to the side through the pentose phosphate pathway. Or if you had a deficiency in NADPH or NADH and you needed to create some more, you could shunt it through this pathway. So when we look here, again, in the cytosol, our substrate is glucose 6-phosphate. Our key enzyme step for this reaction is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So it's an oxidative reaction. You also are going to have transketolase. Transketolase is going to be a non-oxidative reaction that requires TPP. So that comes back again, our thiamine. So in a thiamine-depleted state, we have a hard time moving forward with transketolase and actually moving forward with the pentose phosphate pathway shunt. So again, this is our oxidative pathway up here. It then moves to our non-oxidative pathway down here. Everything's abbreviated because I don't want you to memorize all these things on the slide. It's not worth your brain space unless you're going to be a biochemist. This enzyme here, let me find it. This doop, transketolase. Gosh, I wish I could see. Sorry, I, it, my thing goes away, so I don't know where it, it is. I'm just like randomly circling things. Okay, there we go. That's your transketolase. Your glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Your product, again, NADPH and ribose sugars. And your key intermediate is NADPH. That's your key thing you're producing here. It's providing a shunt, a workaround shunt. You can see you can get back into glycolysis through several different pathways from the pentose phosphate pathway. But at the end of the day, if I had to choose a purpose of why we have this pathway, it's to produce NADPH or NADH. Again, specific tissues, liver, red blood cells, mammary glands, adrenal cortex, in the cytosol. Needs thiamine. All right, fatty acid synthesis. I love fatty acid synthesis and beta oxidation. I think these ones are fun. Okay, so fatty acid synthesis is located on the left. It's cut off a little bit. Uh, but that's okay. I don't think we, we need all those things. So fatty acid synthesis is going to occur specifically in your liver, your fat tissue, your mammary glands, and your kidneys. So again, a lot of crossover from our previous pentose phosphate pathway, but we have kidney for this one and fat tissue instead of RBCs and adrenal cortex. It's going to occur within cytosol again. It's going to be able to leave the, the, the mitochondria Fats are going to leave the mitochondria via a citrate shuttle. So citrate it is an important molecule because it can shuttle things in and out of the mitochondria. Our substrate that we start with is acetyl-CoA. We know acetyl-CoA. We've seen that before. So we take acetyl-CoA that we get from our pyruvate oxidation. Instead of putting it through the Krebs cycle, 
We're like, we don't really need energy. We just ate like a feast. We're going to actually take some of this and store it as fat for fat energy. And that's how this process occurs. Our key enzyme step is going to be acetyl-CoA carboxylase, which needs biotin, so another biotin-needing enzyme. And fatty acid synthase, which has B5 as a part of its structure. So again, more B vitamins. Again, when in doubt, probably guess a B vitamin as a cofactor, you're going to be close. But they often will be, they will make you know the specific B vitamin. So I try to, I try to commit those ones to memory. Your product is going to be palmitate or any fatty acid. But we'll use palmitate for our example. It's regulated by insulin. And your key intermediate here is going to be melanol-CoA. So we see here we have our fatty acids and so this we have acetyl over here. We have melanol over here. We combine these together. We're going to condense. Then we're going to do some reduction. We lose an NADPH. And we create our fatty acid. It's not the best picture. I'll try to find a better. I'll post a better. For our energy, we do use energy to store energy. Interesting. We use one ATP or one melanol CoA, and we use two NADPH slash melanol CoA. But this would be our process to store fat as energy. Start with acetyl CoA. So if you had a question about what processes could acetyl CoA do, acetyl CoA could go into the Krebs cycle and make energy, or it could go into fatty acid synthesis. And it can do a couple other things too. But these are the two major ones we know about thus far. So depending on your energy needs, that will help you answer that question. If you're in a high energy state and you need energy quickly, you're going to probably go through Krebs to try to get ATP. If you're in a low energy state, you don't need energy, you have plenty of glucose around, you're probably going to go into fat storage. You're going to do fatty acid synthesis. So then beta oxidation. Think about everything I just said and we're going to reverse it. Okay? But it's not quite exactly that easy. It doesn't reverse completely the same way. But beta oxidation, this is going to occur primarily in liver, muscle, kidney. It happens within the mitochondria. So where, as previously, we were in the cytosol for fatty acid synthesis, because we were shunted out of the mitochondria, for beta oxidation, for breakdown, we're going to be occurring within the mitochondria, specifically in a peroxisome. Substrate is going to be your fatty acids, ACYLS. Your key step this time is going to be acetyl-CoA synthase. And your end product that you get is acetyl-CoA, some NADH, and some FADH2. So again, energy producing, right? We went from a storage form of a fatty acid, a fatty acyl. We broke it off from, a, from um, life, uh, adipose tissue. So we had adipose tissue. We had storage fat. We broke it off. You break it down, actually, there's a couple steps that happen before you even enter into beta oxidation. And then once you get your fatty acyl there, ACYLS, undergoes several different beta oxidation steps to break us down to get back to acetyl-CoA, NADH, and FADH2. And then we're ready to put acetyl-CoA into, we could put that through the Krebs. We could go back and store fat if we wanted to, or any other thing. We'll get to products in a second, but this one is upregulated by glucagon. Interesting. So if glucagon is telling us that we need sugar, we need energy, makes sense that we would want to try to pull fatty acids. That's a high energy source, right? And why is it a high energy source? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if we think about a fatty acid, this is not just like two carbons. This can be up to 16 carbons, 20 carbons, 22 carbons, all strung together. Carbons and hydrogens, carbons and hydrogens, very high impact, high energy molecule. And we're breaking it down into two carbon chunks in acetyl-CoA. So if we have a 16 carbon saturated fatty acid, it palmitates. So if you have a 16 carbon saturated fatty acid, we're going to break that down into eight acetyl-CoA molecules by doing beta oxidation seven times. So if you think about that, we're going to 
We had 16 carbons, you know, C, 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 et cetera, et cetera. We do beta oxidation, we get two. Beta oxidation, we get two, et cetera, et cetera, until we're down to just all acetyl-CoA molecules. Every time we do beta oxidation, we're getting some of those byproducts of NADH and FADH2 plus acetyl-CoA. That's why fat breakdown oxidation, beta oxidation is such a high yield, but it takes a lot of time because we have to go through this turn of beta oxidation, you know, seven different times to actually be able to get it into usable energy, which then has to be run through Krebs and electron transport chain to actually give us ATP. So that's why if the body can avoid it, it's gonna try not to break down fat. It's gonna try to use up glycogen stores and glucose stores first before it grabs for beta oxidation, before it grabs for fat breakdown. At the end, if you had a 16 carbon molecule, you could get 129 ATP. You'd actually get 131 minus two for activation. So again, the highest, if you had to choose the, what is the highest yield of ATP in a biochemical process, beta oxidation would be your bet, best bet, but also would be the longest, right? Key intermediates, fatty acid CoA and fatty acid carnitine. The fatty acid carnitine is what helps shunt it um, back into the mitochondria. So carnitine and citrate are your big shunts. They help you move in and out of structures. So when in doubt, those are helping you move in or out. All right, doing good. Uh, ketogenesis, ketogenic diet, my most commonly asked about diet in practice. Um, um, not anti-keto, I'm not anti-anything, but there's a lot of misnomers. That's my preceptor. A lot of weird things that come in. Okay. Like, the only reason I'm thinking about this, I have a patient today who I'm going to have to like, try to talk out of her dietary neuroses today. So not with keto, just in general. So it's on my mind. Anyways, ketogenesis occurs in the liver. There is a purpose to it. We, ha we have it happen in the body all the time. It's within the mitochondrial matrix. The substrate that we're using is acetyl-CoA. The key enzyme step, ooh, this one's fun. We recognize this enzyme. HMG-CoA synthase, the friend of HMG-CoA reductase involved in cholesterol synthesis, right? And our products are beta-hydroxybutyrate, dehydrogenase, acetone, and acetoacetate, so our ketones. It's regulated by acetyl-CoA. More acetyl-CoA will increase ketogenesis. So that's to go somewhere. Key intermediates are HMG-CoA, and we're going to actually decrease energy to do this, to make ketones. We're going to lose two acetyl-CoA, and we're going to lose one in ADH. But ketones, the benefit of ketones is they, they do what? What do ketones do? They give you energy, and then what, what can, what, what's special about them? They're what? Fast acting. You can get, you can get them quick. They're quick forms of energy. But you can also put yourself into an uh, acidotic state, right? If you have too much ketones floating around the body. So too much is never a good thing. So there is a special balance. But I think the important takeaways for this one is you start with acetyl-CoA. You end knowing your end product. Uh, this is a beta-hydroxybutyrate, dehydrogenase, acetone, and acetoacetate. I've seen those as answers on NPLEX before. So knowing your end products of ketogenesis would be important. So your beginning and your end. Your key enzyme step. So if that was blocked, what could happen? And then where it's located in the mitochondrial matrix within the liver. You can see down here, they have ketones. Then they, they have this picture of ketones. This is blood. So ketones going into your blood. Um, and then we're going to get here into catalysis here and break down. We have our beta oxidation, our oxidative phosphorylation, our ketone formation. You can start kind of seeing how these things can be related. So let's talk about ketone breakdown. It's an awful picture, but essentially what you're looking at here is you're looking at beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, acetoacetyl CoA, and then acetyl CoA and acetyl CoA. And you're seeing that. There's arrows that are going in both directions here and here, but not here. So this is your committing step right there. So that's why this is an important step here. Succinyl-CoA to succinate. 
but your key regulatory enzyme is actually beta hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase because that is an oxidation reduction reaction. So ketone breakdown happens in brain, skeletal muscle, and heart muscle. It does not occur in the liver. They're made in the liver. They're not broken down in the liver, ironic. Within the mitochondrial matrix as well. So they're made in the liver, they're shunted through blood, they go to the brain, muscle, heart muscle, skeletal muscle, heart muscle, and then they're broken down. The substrates are your project products of ketogenesis. So the products we had previously, your beta hydroxybutyrate, your acetoacetate, and acetone. So if someone's in ketosis, you can smell sometimes the sweetness on their breath or in their urine. Your product, your end product is acetylcholine again. We love acetylcholine when in doubt. Maybe choose that as your product. It happens often. Your key intermediates again is HMG-CoA. And this is energy producing. So you get two acetyl-CoA's, one NADH, and you minus only one GTP, but overall net energy gain from using ketones. So it's a fast form of energy if you don't have anything else around. So this can be a good benefit. Yes, sorry. No, not exactly. So you see here, if you use beta hydroxybutyrate, where's my little pointer? Come back to me. Okay. <laughs> use beta hydroxybutyrate, you're going to get an NADH here, and then you're going to fill it on the pathway. If you come in with acetoacetate, you're going to not gain that NADH because you're starting at acetoacetate downward. So if you start with beta hydroxybutyrate, you get NADH plus then your two acetyl CoAs. If you start with acetate, you will not. Does that make sense? Yeah. By far, you're likely starting with beta hydroxybutyrate, but it is good to note if you had acetate and it didn't go back to hydroxybutyrate, you would be not having the same amount of products. Not at the top of my head. I could find it for you, but I don't keep that information in there. I would say it's most commonly utilized, yes. Then acetoacetate, acetone, not as much. That's exhaled or excreted typically. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And why? Because you get the most energy from it. So that's why we like to utilize it the most. I don't have percentages though. I try not to keep all of those things in my brain, nor could I if I wanted to. But good question. So then cholesterol synthesis. So I teased it, right? We had HMG-CoA. We've been leading up to it. Cholesterol synthesis occurring in our liver, occurring within the cytosol. Again, important to know which compartments things are happening in. That will, have, that will come up. Your substrate's acetyl-CoA. Great. Acetyl-CoA again. Something else it can do. And then your key step is HMG-CoA reductase. That would be your key regulatory enzyme of cholesterol synthesis. Product is cholesterol regulators or insulin amongst other things. And your key intermediates would be HMG-CoA, mevalonate, and CoQ, coenzyme Q. Energy fraction, I just say lots. You get lots of energy from cholesterol, but the body doesn't like to break it down. So typically when you're making cholesterol, you're going to make it and use it and you're not going to break it back down into energy. But if you did, you could get a ton of energy from it. It's a very complex molecule. It takes a lot to make. You get a lot out of it if you use it. Typically though, when the body makes it, it keeps it around. That's why we have such a hard time decreasing cholesterol when we have something like hyperlipidemia. The body likes to hold on and keep it. But your key things here, the most common questions I see are about HMG-CoA reductase, location of cholesterol synthesis, location um, within the cell, the cytosol, and initial substrate. Those are probably the most common questions I see on the NPLEX for cholesterol synthesis. And then the urea cycle. This one occurs in your liver, your cytosol, and your mitochondrial matrix. So it occurs in both because it's shunted into the mitochondrial matrix as a part of the urea cycle. So it starts out in the cytosol and then it's shunted inward. You're going to start with NH4, ammonia, and glucose, and carbon dioxide, and aspartate. 
you're then going to end up with urea as your product. So this is a way to get rid of that toxic ammonia in the body. When you have that buildup, you can see um, liver failure or encephalopathies or thing, things like that, coma, stupor, death. So it's an important process to have. Uh, so when you see issues in the urea cycle, you can look at issues when the liver first for pathology. You'll see it systemically, but I would look at the liver. Regulators are going to be N-acetyl glutamate. And your key intermediates here are the arginine and fumarate. So the byproducts of arginosexinate. You're going to minus energy to energy doing this process, but you're saving your body build of a toxic substance, so it's worth it in the end. Typical questions about urea cycle tend to be more path questions about urea or ammonia buildup or what is the, how does the body neutralize ammonia buildup? It converts it to urea, uh, things in that nature. So knowing the uh, start product, the NH4 glucose, CO2 aspartate, and the end product would probably be your best bang for your buck and where it's located, the liver and cytosol plus mitochondrial matrix. And that's biochemistry. You've learned it all in an hour and a half. All you need to know. Now, I don't think, like, I know it's a lot. I will post a better picture of that one um, gluconeogenesis, so that's on there. The more you kind of just go through these locations, get these things in your brain, or become familiar with these different words, enzymes, and key regulatory steps, the easier it'll be for memory recognition on a test. Again, Biochemistry is a very small portion of the exam, right? So it's not worth you going through and memorizing every pathway here. Hit the major stuff. There's going to be some weird questions they ask you won't get, and that's okay. But if you have these basics down, you'll get the majority of your biochemistry questions correct. Yeah. Yeah. you'll be fine. Anytime they're asking for a rate limiting, they're asking for the key regulatory enzyme. What is that step that the key regulatory enzyme oversees? If you know that step, you're probably going to be able to know that question. Absolutely. Good. The other questions they often will do is cofactors, anything where they can throw a vitamin or a mineral in there, Grandies, right? They're like, oh, you should, we should be the experts, which we should, in biochemical use of vitamins and minerals. So those questions are included a lot on the exam for biochemistry. Um, and then a little, there probably won't be any real ATP generation outside of understanding uh, in general what enzymatic processes or biochemical processes produce energy and which use energy. So then if you're in a metabolic state that they're giving you, where might you go? What direction might you go down? Would you go down glycolysis? Would you go down um, lactic acid formation? Would you store fat? Would you use fat? So those would be the type of questions where biochemistry could be used for you all. Awesome. Questions for me. We got through it in about the time I thought we was. But I want to save time for questions today if there's anything that's come up. Pressing on your soul. Tomorrow, we are going to go through gastro. We're going to go through kidney. So tomorrow is going to be a big day. We're going to talk about GI and the kidney. So renal and the gut. The gut. We'll go through all of those fun ion pathways, and then we'll also go through kind of the digestive process as a whole from start to finish to help you remember all those good things that go in and out and what can happen when they go wrong. So there'll be a lot of physio with some path mixed in tomorrow. Great. Dr. Peckshaw? Yes. Um, I have a question. Awesome. How would you recommend um, committing the small details from your biochemistry uh, PowerPoint to memory? Yeah, great question. Um, I'll stop sharing a little, oh, I don't know if I can see you. But uh, so how would I commit these to memory? I would say flashcards by far are the best memory committal device as well as drawing out these processes. So writing out the process in general, not every single step, but glycolysis, what's your start product, what's your end product and have your key enzyme in the middle. The more you write it out physically or do quick flashcard review without checking notes, the better it'll commit to your own, your own brain. 
I had, um, when I studied for this test, I had a poster board and I just drew them all together on a poster board from start to finish. I had a seal coa in the middle, all the directions the seal coa could go. I had glucose, all the directions glucose could go. And I just wrote down the key enzyme steps and the key um, intermediates that the enzyme was involved with. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah, totally. I've posted probably about like 10 flashcard sets on the Moodle page. It's under miscellaneous study materials. So if you are looking for some flashcards just to go through, there are a few that are specifically biochemistry in nature. So those might be helpful if flashcards help you commit things to brain, your brain and you don't want to waste time making your own. By far, though, creating your own is going to be the best way of studying because you'll write questions in the way that you understand. Um, but there are flashcards that's available for you online if that's the way you learn best. Great. Any other questions? You, if you're done, you can go forth and leave. You don't have to stay. Yeah, totally. Thank you all. Tomorrow, the gut, the kidney, Monday, our entry into micro and immuno, my favorite day. Tuesday, a practice test. Bye, all of you online. Thank you for being here.